Okay, we proceed with the, the next speaker. Uh, today, next talk is by uh, Simeon Abramian, and uh, uh, he will speak on the homology of the MSU spectrum. Please. Yeah, thank you for uh, introducing me and thank uh, all the organizator, uh, organizers for this uh, seminar. So, uh, yeah, my talk is about uh, homology of uh, the THOM MSU spectrum. So, uh, probably I should start from the, with some history of the topic. So, yeah, so uh, this topic is about is kind of about the uh, Borgism theory, and this is a classical topic of algebraic topology. And uh, well, the Borgism theory was actively developed in 1950s, 1960s by uh, many, uh, well, many topologists, for example, uh, Pantriagin, Tom, um, Milner, Atia, and uh, Novikov, Bustaber, yeah, uh, and Nigel Ray. Yeah, so, yeah, so first fundamental result uh, due to Pantragin and Tom connects, uh, well, pure geometric uh, Borgism theory with the stable homotopy theory. So I will, uh, well, I will state the theorem uh, in a few minutes. So, yeah, but now few few words. So, uh, yes, yeah, so now, uh, well, after that, uh, there is a kind of um, question. So how to compute Borgism ring? So the answer was kind of uh, was given by Adams with, uh, with his uh, spectral sequence. So, uh, yes, yeah, so Adams spectral sequence uh, gave an opportunity to calculate Borgism rings and, uh, well, first, Oop, sorry. And first application, well, uh, not first, but kind of, uh, 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 well, uh, uh, yeah, well, one of the first applications of the Adam spectral sequence uh, is a calculation of complex Borgism ring. And uh, well, this is, the following isomorphism. So uh, this is a complex Borgian ring, which I will define in a few means. And this is, and it is isomorphic to a polynomial algebra with a, a one generator in each even degree. Yeah. And uh, this result is due to uh, Milner and Novikov. Yeah. So a few years later, in uh, 1967, uh, Sergei Petrovich Novikov proposed a new approach to a Bordism and stable homotopy theory based on uh, so-called Adams Novikov spectral sequence. This is a spectral sequence with second term. This is x over mu star mu star. Uh, well, from uh, uh, yeah, so from mu star of something to mu star and it converges to uh, p star of x yeah and uh, well as an illustration of this approach uh, Novikov outlined a complete description of uh, of the additive additive torsion and uh, the multiplicative structure of uh, special unitary Borges ring. Well, but still uh, this result uh, uh, 
re relies on proving the following isomorphism that omega of SU tensored with, well, that uh, uh, special unitary Borges ring with inverted two is a polynomial algebra with one generator in each uh, even degree starting from uh, four. Yeah, so, yeah, so uh, this result first appeared in Novikov's uh, 1962 paper with only a sketch of proof. Yeah, so although the result has been considered as known uh, since 60s, uh, its full proof has been missing in the literature, well, at all. So, yeah, and uh, yeah, main goal of my today's talk is to kind of give a proof in, uh, well, using classical uh, approach uh, uh, of Adam spectral sequence. Well, but still, uh, well, to, to prove this result, we first should know something about homology of MSU spectrum. So now I will uh, move to definitions. So first of all, let us say what is a, a well, complex Borgism or SU Borgism. So uh, suppose, uh, so, okay. So denote by BK either of two uh, classical vibrations of classifying spaces. So now we say that uh, complex structure or special unitary structure on n-dimensional manifold is a pair of embedding this manifold into uh, Rn plus K with a normal bundle nu. nu. So uh, as well, it is uh, known that uh, this bundle can be classified by a map from M to uh, B O K. So, and the second uh, guy in this pair, th this is just a lift of this map into B K. So, in the case of uh, U uh, unitary structure, th this is lift to B U. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I want here to be 2K, 2, mm. so the, 2K, and here I have K. Yeah, and in the case of special unitary structure, we have here BSU to K. So now there are, uh, well, there are structures that we should uh, consider as the same. Namely, if we have two structures, one, well, one is a lift to BK and second is a lift to BK prime. Then uh, two of these structures are called equivalent if there is a homotopy between, well, the homotopy between them in some large uh, BK two prime. So, yeah. So and finally, uh, two manifold, well, two uh, U manifolds or SU manifolds of dimension N called uh, bordant if there is a two n plus one dimensional complex manifolds such that uh, we have uh, such that 
the disjoint union of these two pairs are diffeomorphic as, as U manifolds. Well, this means that we have diff diffeomorphism of manifolds and uh, well, these structures uh, can be uh, pulled, well, the one structure can be pulled back from the another. Okay, so now we can state the fundamental result of Intragen and Tom. So denote by omega NSU, the set of uh, equivalent classes of n-dimensional uh, U-manifolds or SU-manifolds. So then the direct sum of this, well, first of all, these guys are uh, abelian groups with respect to dis disjoint union. Secondly, if we take the direct sum of all these abelian groups, we obtain uh, the great ring. So this is kind of a statement, but this is not so hard to prove. And the fundamental result of Pentragon and Tom states that uh, this ring is isomorphic to uh, homotopy groups of certain spectra. Namely, uh, okay, so uh, probably I should remind you what, well, this is just a uh, Tom spectra uh, corresponding to unitary group. So namely we, we can take BUN, take canonical bundle, bundle over, well, universal bundle over BUN, and then we take, we just take uh, its Tom space. Okay, and then we obtain, uh, yeah, and then the map, the canonical map from BUN to BUN plus one induces the map from the second suspension of uh, Tom space of the universal bundle to Tom space of the universal bundle. So, and this is our spectrum. And its homotopy groups is the uh, yeah, and its homotopy groups is the uh, interesting for us the complex Borjinsky group. Yeah, and the same for special unitary group. Okay, so this is the definition of the Borjism. So now. Uh, how to compute this guy. So uh, yeah, so to compute this guy, we can use the Adam spectral sequence. I will show you the, um, its second term and uh, uh, things uh, to which it converges in a few slides. But first of all, I need to uh, remind you some basic facts about cohomology operations. So recall that, uh, well, in mod prime P cohomology have uh, these uh, cohomology operations that called uh, Steenrad squares in if P is equal to two and Steenrad powers if uh, P is a not prime and uh, these operations is uniquely defined by the following properties. So first of all, uh, yeah, so uh, this, uh, these maps are homomorphisms of vector spaces. Uh, if K is zero, then this guys is just identity maps. Yeah, uh, if in some dimensions, uh, this maps is, uh, well, SQK is uh, uh, just uh, takes element to, uh, maps the element to its square and PK maps an element to its fifth power. And we have Cartan formula. Uh, 
yeah and uh, uh, yeah and if k is bigger than degree then this uh, homomorphism is just zero maps and there are uh, other relations i don't want to well uh, write them down but there are kind of uh, uh, yeah th there are some relations on uh, sqk on the composition of sqk and sqj for example for uh, for some k and j yeah so uh, now what is uh, uh, standard algebra this is just free fp algebra generated by standard squares if p is equal to two and uh, by Bakstein homomorphism and standard uh, powers if p is odd modular the atom relations so now by uh, uh, yeah by uh, cartan -CR -CR theorem there are uh, th there is a nice nice uh, basis of this algebra so uh, this basis of uh, consists of composition of uh, standard operations uh, for which the sequence of powers is so-called admissible. So actually, I don't want to define them here, but uh, why, uh, why, uh, but why uh, this is important? Because we have uh, the nice description of the uh, of the dual algebra yeah so uh, first of all i uh, i would like to note that uh, actually standard algebra ap for any p is a hopf algebra uh, yeah so we know the the product this is just a composition of the operations and the co-product is uh, well it is induced by the map of the spectra so this is well this is just a composition uh, of these two maps. So uh, yeah, HFP is ellenberg maclean spectra. And uh, this is just a uh, uh, spectrum of spheres. So this is equivalence and this map is just uh, the unit wedge identity. So this composition induce, uh, induces the uh, bi-algebra structure on, uh, on AP and there is a uh, antipod, uh, well, antipod uh, which defines in the same way. So, yeah, so now I want to introduce the theorem uh, by Milner, which describes uh, the algebra dual to the Steenroth algebra. So, uh, denote by Xi, uh, well, the monomial dual to uh, this guy with respect to basis of admissible monomials. And in the case of uh, odd P, we have Xi is this composition and tau N is the composition with the Bakstein homomorphism. So then uh, the standard algebra modulo two is just free poly polynomial algebra generated by size and mod P 
uh, dual to standard algebra is uh, free, uh, free graded algebra generated by Xi, Xi n, and Tau n. And here is the co uh, the coproduct in the dual algebra. So uh, yes, yeah, so this is isomorphism of algebras, and this is a coproduct uh, dual to copro uh, dual to multiplication in the standard algebra in terms of xi i's. Okay, so and. Here is the action of antipod. So uh, yeah, so here's an R is just degree of uh, Xi R and uh, E R just a sum of degrees of Xi's uh, in this monomial, then Hopf conjugate in the power of k, uh, in the power k is equal to this guy. So, yeah, we will need it in a few slides to uh, compute the uh, well to compute some structure on the homology of MSU. Okay, so finally, uh, we have our main. Uh, uh, computational tool. This is just the mod P Adam spectral sequence. So it's uh, second term is written here. This is just X from uh, model P cohomology to model P cohomology of the point. And it converges to homotopy groups of X modular Torsion, torsion of order prime p. Yeah, so now uh, we want to pass from the cohomology language to homology language. And this is uh, this can be done by some uh, abstract homological al algebra or general nonsense, uh, whatever. So, and uh, this x is isomorphic to, well, to Kotor pro over the dual to standard algebra from the mod p homology of point to uh, mod p homology of uh, spectrum X. Yeah, so uh, one thing uh, which I should note here that uh, differential here is not, uh, uh, doesn't have the standard uh, B degree, well, standard in terms, kind, uh, for example, um, uh, spectral se sequence of vibration. So this uh, here we have, uh, whoops, sorry, no, no, no uh, that's okay. So uh, uh, that's uh, after change of n indices, indices uh, it, it will help. Uh, well, okay, so, and differential has a standard, Sorry. So now, uh, yeah. So while, now we want to pass to computation of MSU homology as a comodule over the dual to standard algebra. So first of all, uh, it is known that we have this isomorphism of homology of MU. Uh, spectrum. So, yeah, here I should recall that uh, primitive elements in uh, in any module. This is just uh, okay. So we have, sorry, we have coaction from homology of MU module P to AP star standard with mu homology module p and elements here is called primitive if under the uh, coaction x maps to one times x 
Okay, so since this uh, coaction map is uh, uh, multiplicative, the primitive elements form a sub subalgebra in homology of MU. And this sub subalgebra uh, is, well, it is described here. So this is free algebra generated by elements of degree not equal to uh, uh, two times P to the power T minus one for any T. And we have uh, isomorphism of commodules described here. So this is just, uh, so homology of MU modular uh, FP is free, uh, is free commodule over AP prime, where AP is just dual to uh, standard algebra modular Bakstein homology. Yeah, so now uh, we can use it to describe the homolo homology of MSU spectrum. So first of all, recall that uh, by uh, lemma, uh, or, uh, by Adam's lemma, we have the, we have that uh, homology of MSU is just free polynomial algebra with uh, one generator in, each even degree starting from four. So now the one of the main theorems of uh, today my today's talk is the following. So uh, fix odd prime p. Then we have elements uh, in homology of MU such that they uh, uh, they are polynomial generators of mod p homology of mu. First of all, they are, uh, uh, well, they are good uh, from the point of view of coaction maps. Namely, uh, they are primitive in uh, degrees which we are need. Uh, well, we have, uh, yeah, then, the isomorphism between homology of, uh, well, isomorphism between these two guys, uh, this and this is an explicit and written here. And finally, the most interesting for us that if we take uh, YN to be polynomial generators uh, that N and that uh, n to the power p in given degrees, then uh, this yn generates, uh, well, uh, this yn is uh, polynomial generators of mod p MSU homology. Yeah, so, yeah, how, how many times do I have left? I guess 10 minutes, yes. Just one time. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so I have 10 minutes left, yes. Okay, so uh, I want to sketch of, uh, to give you a sketch of proof of the theorem. And I guess I'll spend five minutes on that and then I will state the theorem. So. Yeah, so uh, now I want to pick a uh, pick good ZN uh, to be a polynomial generator of MU, uh, MU homology. So if uh, degrees is uh, not equal to P to the power T or P to the power T minus one, I can take uh, the n to be the forever image of the polynomial generators of, uh, well, mod p uh, complex bordes and ring. So, for example, we can take uh, uh, we can take 
we can take CP1 times CP1 times CP n minus one and take here the manifold uh, which is dual. Whoops. to the first chain class. Yeah, and, and then we, we, we can just take, well, for average image of H, and this is element of mod P homology of MU. Yeah, now if, uh, if n is equal to p to the power t, we can take just uh, x size, which is, uh, yeah, which is these guys. So we can take just these primitive elements. And finally, uh, if n is equal to t power t, uh, p to the power t minus one, we can take the, uh, uh, image under the tom isomorphism of the uh, of the dual to uh, the churn class, where dual uh, is meant to be dual with respect to the monomial basis of in in the CIs. Yeah. So first of all, clearly uh, we have that. Uh, this guys lies. Uh, this guy lies in the homology of MSU because uh, here n is greater than one, uh, and uh, it is clear that uh, these guys. Well, that uh, the n in in this case. Uh, lie in the homology of MS, MSU too, because we uh, because we have taken the dual to the first chunk class, and this is SU manifold. Yeah. So now, uh, yeah, I have a few minutes left, so I'll skip uh, the. Yeah, so, so now we have a kind of theorem of uh, Brown Davis Peterson that describes the coaction map uh, on the, uh, well, on the uh, dual to churn classes. That, uh, and in particular, this theorem implies that <coughs> uh, our our Z's, which is, uh, uh, well, for N is equal to uh, P to the power T minus one, has this nice uh, coaction. So this implies that uh, uh, these guys are indecomposable, and in particular, they are poly polynomial generators of, uh, MU homology. And moreover, uh, since in the composition here, sorry, we factor uh, by ZI where I is P to the power T minus one. Here we have this second uh, sum, which is this sum maps to zero. And therefore our composite maps these guys to uh, to hope conjugate to uh, psi t. And uh, yeah, so this kind of, that's all. So we have proved that <coughs> uh, that the ice which we uh, took is a polynomial generators. Uh, well, we have described, well, uh, the, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, the composite, 
is an isomorphism because, well, because uh, we know that, uh, yeah, that we know that uh, this composite maps uh, the eyes to, well, to itself for for n, which is not equal to p to the power t minus one, and it maps uh, the other z's to polynomial generators of a p prime. Therefore, this map is is an isomorphism. So we have only left to prove that. <coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, that in this, uh, well, if we take pi n as written here, that uh, these guys are polynomial generators of MSU. So for n not equal to p to the power t minus one, uh, we already know that these guys are polynomial generators of MU. And in particular, if they are, uh, if they uh, lie in MSU homology, then they are polynomial generators there. So we have only uh, left to prove that these guys are polynomial generators of MSU. And this was done actually by Adams in the proof of the isomorphism, which, has, which I mentioned above, that MSU with, with Z coefficients is free polynomial algebra on two, three, et cetera. And <coughs> so, uh, yeah, so this finishes the proof of the, uh, my theorem. So, uh, yeah, I guess I have uh, two minutes left and I want to mention two results. So now using this, actually, uh, we can prove the two following Novikov theorem. So first of all, we can compute the uh, SU Borges ring with inverted two. And uh, yeah, I have sketch here, but unfortunately, unfortunately I don't have time to say a few words about this. And finally, the most interesting and most technical result, uh, which we can prove using the, uh, using the computation of mod p MSU homology is the Milner genus of the polynomial generators of the SU Borges ring with inverted two. So namely, yes, yeah, so of this, uh, it is written here and uh, probably it is, easier, it is easier to write and to listen. Yeah, I guess that's all and I have no time uh, left. So thank you for your attention. Uh, uh, let's thank the speaker. Uh, thank you very much, Simon. And uh, are there any questions or comments? Uh, yeah, could I ask a very short question? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, Simon, uh, so am I correct that, so your, <laughs> the corollaries that you said means that your, your, the construction that you provided gives you a, an alternative proof, right, to Novikov's results, to the two Novikov's theorems you mentioned, yes. right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, yeah, there should be uh, commented that actually in uh, Sergei uh, Petrovich Novikov's paper, the proof uh, of this result, the structure of the uh, cobordism ring with two inverted, is very is quite sketchy. He basically gives some ideas and says that it's mostly similar to the proof of the corresponding result of the MU spectrum, which he also gave. But filling in filling in those details required quite a lot of technical work, and so that that was, and uh, Simon needed to establish the coaction of the Steiner al algebra on the homology of the MSU spectrum to to fill in all those details. So that that's that's what he did. Yes. Well, uh, any other questions, comments? 
Uh, well, if not, let's thank the speaker again. Uh, and uh, we have 10 minutes break and we resume in uh, 12.40 in Moscow time. Uh, this Denis is translation on. Yes, it is. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, let us continue. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, the next speaker. Uh, Tsixi Wan from uh, Fudan University will speak on distinguishing four dimensional geometries via profile completions. So. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank to the organizers about their work and inviting. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, distinguishing four-dimensional geometries via profinite completions. It's a joint work with my supervisor, Ji Ma of the University. Uh, today's talk is uh, about three parts, such that, firstly, I will roughly uh, introduce the four-dimensional geometries in the sense of Thurston. And lastly, profinite completions with low-dimensional topology. And finally, I will especially introduce the profinite completions and four-dimensional geometries. We say X is an n-dimensional geometry in the sense of Thurston. It means a pair XG for X is a one-connected n-dimensional smooth Riemann manifold with a Lie group action G. This G action is required to be transitive, effective, and isometrical, and which could be seen as the isometric group of X for a certain Riemann matrix. So G is maximal among all such Lie groups acting on X. And we call a manifold M a limiting geometry 
if it's a quotient x by a discrete subgroup uh, of isometrical group gamma, such that uh, the quotient has finite volume. And in the three-dimensional case, we all know that Thurston classified all the eight geometries and the six geometries could be realized as three-dimensional safe fiber spaces. Uh, in the four-dimensional case, Flipkowitz classified all the four-dimensional geometries in the sense of Thurston, and there are totally 19 classes of maximal geometry. And with, there is one class consisting of infinitely many non-equivalent geometries. Uh, any closed orientable form manifold with uh, eight geometries among 19 could be realized as safer fiber manifold except for two flat manifolds. Uh, and it is similar to the theorem in three dimensional. And this is a table of 19 classes of four dimensional geometries. We could see that the first type is the geometries which uh, which could be realized as manifold with finite uh, fundamental group. And the second type is the tangent space of two-dimensional hyperbolic space. And this geometry has the lattices which, is, uh, which are not non-uniform, which means that uh, it could not be realized as any closed manifold. So these two types that uh, is excluded to our question. And the third type is geometry has new potent fundamental group. Uh, and there are uh, about uh, uh, 4,000 of orbifolds uh, in the Euclidean geometry. And there are only uh, 74 manifolds. The next type is solo manifolds and it is the Thor MN geometry, which includes infinitely many non-equivalent geometries. The next type is a product type with spherical factor. And the next type is the aspherical factor, uh, the hyperbolic factor times Euclidean factors. The last type of product geometry is two-dimensional hyperbolic space times two-dimensional hyperbolic space. And finally, the four-dimensional hyperbolic space and two-dimensional complex hyperbolic space. The last uh, uh, type, uh, the last three geometries are what uh, we could not distinguish them from each other. But what we can do is to distinguish them from the uh, rest of geometries. And we should introduce some examples of four-dimensional geometries. The geometry saw MN uh, is a semi-direct product of a real space by a, a, a three-dimensional real space by another one-dimensional real space. Uh, it is associated to a polynomial FMN such that the coefficients are uh, one minus uh, one uh, negative m, positive n, and uh, positive one. And this polynomial has three distinct real roots, uh, which we could denote it as an exponential form. Then the semi-direct product with the action theta mm by a diagonal uh, matrix uh, by the three distinct real roots. Uh, for a close orientable saw M manifold, it has a fundamental group of form semi-direct product such that uh, uh, the action is represented by a, a integer matrix with a determinant one and B has three distinct real integer values. Uh, when M equals to N, the geometry saw MM is actually the three-dimensional solvable geometry times the one-dimensional Euclidean geometry, where the manifolds admit safe fiber structure, and theta mm has one and only one engine value equals to one. 
And now we can define uh, what is a safer fiber four manifold. It means that uh, it uh, admits a bundle structure over closed to or before the B, such that the general fiber is true torus. Uh, we mean the general fiber. Uh, it's there are finitely many uh, singular points over the two orbifold. To describe all the safe four manifolds, we use the safe environments, which are similar to those of three-dimensional safe fiber manifolds. And for an example, in the simplest case, uh, consider M a two torus bundle over two torus as a, B to integer matrix uh, such that A and B commute and M, N are two integers. Then we can express its fundamental group as uh, this representation, uh, where L, L and H are generators of the general fiber and S, T are the lift of the gener generators of base torus. The relations re the relations on the right hand uh, represents the conjugate action of the uh, base, uh, the generators of the base to the fibers, and it measures the, uh, the how the fiber twisted a uh, twist along the uh, close uh, along the loop on the base, and uh, for a T two bond. Uh, a torus bundle over torus, it could admit geometry uh, of these four types, uh, which depends on the monodromies A and B and uh, its Euler number MN, which is defined by Y. And we should remark that uh, this representation is not unique. Uh, it's up to a series of transformations. By classifying closed orientable four dimensional safe fiber manifolds using four dimensional safe environments, Y connected these manifolds to substance geometry, which have the following theorem. Uh, let M be a closed orientable four manifold, which is safe fibered over a true orbifold B. Then B is spherical or bad if and only if M admits geometry three sphere times a uh, one dimensional Euclidean space or two sphere times two dimensional Euclidean space. B is flat if and only if M admit one of geometries uh, these four, except for two flat manifolds, which are not safer. And B is hyperbolic. Uh, then either uh, M admit one of geometries, the universal cover of special linear group uh, over real uh, over real field, real number field uh, times one dimensional Euclidean geometry and two dimensional hyperbolic geometry times two dimensional Euclidean geometry, or M could not admit any geometric structure. Now we talk something about profinite completions. For a discrete group G, let a calligraphic N denote the collection of all its normal, uh, normal subgroup with finite index. Then by declaring that whenever Ni is subgroup of Nj, uh, uh, N, we denote that Ni is less or equal to Nj then the calligraphic N is partially ordered with the natural epimorphism phi ij from the quotient G by Ni to the quotient G by Nj. Uh, there is uh, an inverse system. And we call its in inverse limit as the profinite completion of G, which is denoted as G hat. The profinite completion of G consisting of elements such that it satisfies some uh, condition for the inverse limit. So 
the profinite completion of G is a subset of the direct product of all the finite quotients of G with subspace topology by the product pro topology on the direct product. And G hat is compact, Hausdorff totally disconnected, and uncountable as a topological group. We should give some examples about profinite groups. The firstly is the profinite integers, which is the inverse uh, limit of all the uh, cyclic groups of n elements, such that the elements of profinite completion of Z uh, satisfies the uh, congruence relations. And the next example is the p adic integers, such that it's the inverse limit of integers, uh, the quotient of integers of uh, n's uh, power to p elements. Uh, and uh, the theorem, theorem that we always use is that uh, uh, the profinite completion of z is the direct sum of it uh, is the direct product of all the p adic integers that p uh, runs over all the prime numbers uh, there is another important pro property to introduce such that we call a group g is relatively finite if for every non-trivial element there is some finite index normal subgroup N such that the non-trivial element is not in this uh, normal subgroup. Uh, a group G is gradually finite uh, if and only if all the finite index normal subgroup uh, intersect to the identity element. And we use gradually finiteness because G is gradually finite if and only if uh, the, uh, the, the homomorphism from G to its profinite completion induced by all the uh, maps from G to its uh, finite index normal subgroup, uh, the induced homomorphism iota from G to its to G hat is injective. And there are also some examples for relatively finite groups. Firstly, is the nth power of integer groups and the free groups. Hence, there are surface groups and fundamental group groups of closed uh, spherical three manifold are all relatively finite. It's uh, after the work of Perelman of hyper, uh, hyperbolicizations. There are also some examples of groups that which are not relatively finite. The first part is infinite simple group. Uh, and next type is a bumps like solitary group with uh, two generators and one relation. Uh, the BS group is relatively finite if and only if uh, when M and N are all have absolute value uh, one or uh, they have uh, equal absolute value. And hence, for any dimension which is larger than three, there is an spherical close and manifold such that its fundamental group is not relatively finite, since it's it is a subgroup of BS group. Uh, following a series of theorems about relatively finite group and uh, some property called goodness, we conclude the relatively finite we need such that for a closed orientable four manifold, a uh, four dimensional manifold with one of certain geometries, then it has relatively finite fundamental group. Uh, the correspondence from a discrete group to its profinite completion has been made such that uh, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between all the finite index subgroup of G to the, all the open subgroup of G hat, 
such that uh, we use the embedding image of G in G hat. The co correspondence is that uh, for a finite index subgroup of G, it is correspond to the closed tau in G hat uh, by the profinite topology. Uh, for a open subgroup of G hat, it intersects to to G itself. And more importantly, the profinite completion maintains the property of being normal, maintains the index, and finally, uh, if a subgroup of G has finite index, then the closed how is isomorphic to its profinite completion. And it is clear that G and G hat has the same set of finite quotients. Uh, then we could ask, ask naturally that uh, uh, there is a theorem that uh, uh, for G1 and uh, G2 be two finitely generated as abstract groups, then they have isomorphic finite completions if and only if they have the same set of finite quotients. And we could ask naturally that to what extent is a group G determinant by its profinite completion? That is to ask that to what extent is G determinant by all its finite quotients. Uh, the Discussion of profinite group is not trivial uh, since there are uh, strange, strange ph uh, phenomena happens that for the great free um, non-abelian group Fn, then its profinite completion contains some closed surface a group of genus at least two. And also there is also a uh, example such that uh, a is a normal uh, subgroup of G, uh, such that A is finite generated, G is gradually finite. And A is not a direct factor of G, but A hat is, is a direct factor of G hat. And we call a gradually finite group G in a certain family of groups C. Uh, we say it's profinite rigid in C. If G could be distinguished by its profinite completion up to isomorphism. And when the uh, profinite rigidity fails, we call it the profinite flexibility. And when C denotes all the finite gener generated gradually finite groups, we say that G admits absolutely profinite rigidity. And it is still open that for a free non-abelian group, uh, is Fn, uh, is it is it profinite rigid in the absolute sense? And there are also examples of profinite flexibility for neopotent group, such that it's a semi-direct product of a cyclic group with eleven elements and uh, uh, by uh, integer groups such that it, uh, gamma one and gamma two have uh, non-isomorphic actions, but they indeed have isomorphic profinite completions. Uh, it is because that the direct sum of gamma one and the integer group are, is isomorphic to the direct sum of gamma two and the integer group. Uh, and we should ask, about uh, uh, the profinite completion with low dimensional topology uh, background. That is the fundamental group of three manifold determined by its finite quotients or equivalently by its profinite completion. And Alan Reid gave a talk in ICM uh, about major problems and recent work about profinite rigidity related to low dimensional topology. Uh, there is evidence about a profinite rigidity uh, such that for 
uh, almost um, uh, 32,000 of hyperbolic three manifolds that uh, there are no two hyperbolic three manifolds uh, in this category have the same collection of finite quotients. Uh, it's just the, the evidence. Uh, and uh, by the uh, proof of torsion, uh, by the corollary of torsion growth conjecture, we could know that profinite completions detect simply short volume or hyperbolic volume of closed irreducible orientable three manifolds. Um, by the theorem of Jenkins at Brain, we know that profinite completions detect the fiberness of hyperbolic three manifolds, which means that if two hyperbolic three manifolds has isomorphic profinite completions, then uh, one is fibered uh, if and only if the other one is fibered. Brisson, Condor, and Reid proved that the function groups are profinitely rigid among all the lattices of connected Lie groups. Uh, Wilton and Zalaski proved that uh, uh, for a three-dimensional geometric manifold with one, uh, with one geometry in the sense of Thurston, its geometry could be distinguished by the profinite completion of its fundamental group. And it is the profinite analog of hyperbolization theorem and the safer conjecture. And Brisson, McRenoids, Reid, and Slater uh, shows that there exists arithmetic lattice uh, for three-dimensional hyperbolic space, which are not which are profinitely rigid in the absolute sense. It's, uh, it's highly, high, highly non-trivial. And Elio uh, shows that uh, for a hyperbolic three manifold with finite volume, then its fundamental group is almost profinitely rigid among all the finitely generated three manifold groups. Uh, what means almost profinitely rigid? It means that there are only finitely many three manifold, uh, three manifold groups uh, have, have isomorphic profinite completions. There are also some examples for profinite flexibility. A funer gave in infinite pairs of non-homeomorphic uh, three-dimensional solvable manifolds with isomorphic profinite completions. It's based on the work of Stabe, such that uh, consider uh, gamma one and gamma two are two semi-direct products by different uh, uh, integer matrix. Uh, then gamma one is not isomorphic to gamma two, but they have isomorphic profinite completions. And works proves the profinite rigidity uh, in the in all the three-dimensional closed orientable safer fiber manifolds, except uh, when the geometry is two-dimensional hyperbolic space times one-dimensional Euclidean space, uh, and this exception is exhibited by Hempel. And considering about the four-dimensional substance geometry. Uh, Stover shows there are, uh, there are examples for the two-dimensional complex hyperbolic manifold such that uh, it is not profinitely rigid. And Pewick, Popwick, and Wilkes prove the profinite rigidities of four-dimensional Euclidean orbifolds among themselves. Uh, it is based on the computer gram gap. And the, the proof is based on the theorem such that a four-dimensional Euclidean orbifold has a fundamental group, which could be seen as a, a crystallographic group. And we focus on the problem that for a closed orientable four-dimensional manifold, uh, whether its geometry type could be distinguished by its profinite completion. And result, we conclude the, the following theorem, which are similar to the work of Wilton and Zalaski, but we could not uh, prove the 
theorem as good as them. Uh, theorem one is that for M and N are two closed orientable four dimensional manifolds with infinite fundamental groups and distinct geometry types, then uh, they have uh, they have non-isomorphic profinite completions, except uh, uh, for when xi and x2 are in these three geometries. Uh, this is the part that we could not prove, but uh, uh, we could prove that uh, these geometries are apart from the rest of them. And for a closed orientable four-dimensional safe fiber manifold, it may not admit any geometry structure when the monodromy doesn't meet certain conditions. However, whether it is geometric could also be detected by its profinite completion, such that uh, let M and N be two a closed orientable four-dimensional safer fiber manifold over hyperbolic orbifold. And suppose they have isomorphic profinite completions of fundamental group, then M is geometric if and only if N is geometric. And we should remark that we use the result of Wilton and Zasky about profinite completions of three dimensional hyperbolic lattice groups, which in turn depends essentially on the dramatic development of ego and wise about a cubic complexion, uh, cubic complexes. And there is some uh, simple example for the part of the proof of theorem one about distinguishing geometries such that uh, consider M and N, uh, that M admits saw M N geometry while N admits saw zero ge geometry. Then by their properties, uh, they both have the uh, fundamental group of form semi direct product by two uh, matrix A and B. And we could prove that uh, their profinite completions are also have the form of semi direct, semi -direct product. And hence, uh, it's fundamental group has isomorphic profinite completion if and only if A and B are conjugate in every congruent subgroup of a uh, congruent subgroup of GL, a general linear group uh, for any integer. And if the isomorphism exists, we could prove that A and B have same characteristic polynomial, which could prove that uh, M and N have the same geometry, uh, which lead to the contradiction. Uh, this is gener uh, generally my talk today. Uh, thanks for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, let's thank the speaker. And are there any questions or comments? Well, uh, I, uh, I in actually I have uh, one question. Uh, um, it concerns. Uh, well, could you show once more the list of, uh, of four-dimensional geometries? Uh, uh, yes, of course. On, on one of the first uh, several slides. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Is this the slides you want to see? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, Actually, uh, uh, as far as I understand, do you mean that in this important type there are only finite uh, number of examples, uh, or this is only orbifolds? And what about manifolds? Uh, 
Uh, I'm sorry, you're asking about the new potent type. Yeah. Uh, yes, there are indeed only finitely many uh, groups in the four-dimensional Euclidean geometry. Uh, since it, uh, it is the uh, crystallographic group. Ah, sorry, uh, it is on, only for four-dimensional four Euclidean, yeah? Uh, yes, only four-dimensional ah, Euclidean. Oh, oh, yeah, then, then it's okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I thought that it's... Uh, uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, well, if not, uh, let's thank the speaker again. So, thank you very much. And, um, well, we resume in... So, sorry, I... Where is, where is the schedule? In 23 minutes, if we follow the schedule. Yeah, yeah, okay. We resume in 23 minutes. Uh, 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 sorry. Uh, so now it's a break. Uh, Denis, is translation on? Yes. Give me a second. I also want to record it. Okay. Yes. Now everything's all right. Okay. So uh, we start the last talk of today's morning session. And the speaker is Denis Garatkov. Uh, he will speak on a combinatorial formula for the third pentagon class in terms of combinatorial curvature redistribution. So. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Gaifullin. Um, by the way, the talk is based on a joint work exactly with Professor Gaifullin. So uh, I'll be talking about uh, contragon class formulas for combinatorial manifolds and I'll first do just a general introduction, some few words. I believe that my slides are uh, very optimistic. The number of my slides is very optimistic for a 40 minute talk. Uh, so uh, sorry if I skip some of them. Uh, I'll try to make it as concise as possible. Uh, so first of all, let me recall uh, some definitions. Uh, there are several equivalent definitions of Pentragon classes uh, for smooth manifolds. And uh, in general, Pentragon classes are characteristic classes uh, in uh, dimensions uh, divisible by four. So the i Pentragon class lies in the four i cohomology of uh, a manifold M. And uh, you can write them uh, in different ways uh, using various classical approaches. So the first approach would uh, use the cohomology of the uh, infinite dimension real Grassmannian. And you can write explicitly uh, the cohomology classes of the representatives for the cohomology classes uh, using the standard cell decomposition of uh, the real Grassmannian. And uh, as soon as you have uh, those cohomology classes in the Grassmannian, you can pull back them under the classifying map for the tangent bundle. Uh, the second approach uh, follows the uh, first chronologically approach to characteristic classes, which is a characteristic classes as abstractions, as uh, abstractions to uh, continuing a family of uh, linearly independent uh, vector fields, where do they fail to be linearly independent? And for stiefel whitney classes, for example, uh, the cycle on which the rank of um, M, let's say, uh, vector fields falls by one, this cycle uh, is one carry dual to the corresponding stiefel whitney class. Uh, at the same time, contracting classes correspond to the generacies of rank two. 
when uh, to the cycles where the rank of m vector fields falls at least by two. Uh, you can also define real contragion classes in terms of a cur in terms of a curvature. This goes along with churn whale theory, uh, and you have to uh, write some invariant invariant polynomial uh, in the curvature form of some connection on your manifold M. All of those definitions are due to Pentragon in the 1940s. Uh, some words about the integer Pentragon classes first. The integer Pentragon classes are not topological invariants, which makes them uh, not a good invariant to use, usually. Uh, however, if you go to rational coefficients, then first of all, by, a, by the classical result of Rothlin, Schwartz, and independently Tom, uh, the rational contracting classes are invariant under all PL homeomorphisms, at least. Uh, and a stronger result by uh, Sergei Petrovich Novikov is that uh, the rational contracting classes are invariant under all homeomorphisms of your underlying manifold. Uh, now to the problem of the combinatorial computation. Uh, suppose you have a combinatorial manifold M. I'll give, I'll recall the uh, definition for the commodal manifold a bit later, uh, but roughly all triangulations of smooth manifolds will do. Uh, we have to compute explicitly its rational Pontragon classes. What do I mean by explicitly computing? I mean that we have your cohomology class, uh, you have the dual to it, the Poincaré dual, and you want to write explicitly a simplicial cycle which represents the homology class dual when carry dual to the corresponding contracting class. Uh, there is a motivation of why uh, we are searching for a very precise, look, precise, precise looking formula, uh, which comes from churn whale theory once more. If we have a smooth Riemannian manifold, then its case and dragon class, as we earlier mentioned, can be represented by a closed differential form that depends on the metric only locally. And so we want to find formulas that would be in some sense local. Uh, in the combinatorial uh, sense, the mo more or less the only natural way to define a local formula would be in the following way. So suppose we want to find a formula for the k von Dragon class. And uh, so we take the Poincaré dual and we have to receive a cycle, an uh, m minus 4k dimensional cycle. So the cycle should be just the sum of simplices of m minus 4k dimensional simplices with some coefficients. And the locality condition here means that the coefficient uh, corresponding to the simplex sigma only depends on the neighborhood of the simplex in combinatorial terms on the link of the simplex. So the coefficient should be some function on all 4K minus one dimensional uh, combinatorial spheres. Uh, why? Uh, so 4K minus one dimension because the link of any M minus 4K simplex is a 4K minus one dimensional sphere. <laughs> I'll recall and will mostly be, will only be working with the first one tracking class. So in our case, we will have three dimensional combinatorial spheres, which is a much, much simpler object. Uh, let me just quickly recall uh, the basic definitions that we will need, and they already used a bit. So if we have an arbitrary simplex sigma of a simplicial complex K, then the star is just the union of all simplices that contain our given sigma. For example, uh, on the picture drawn here, uh, if this is sigma, uh, then all of the, all of the uh, simplices that are uh, drawn are exactly its star. And the link uh, of a simplex sigma is such a subcomplex of the star that it consists of all of the simplices not intersecting with our sigma. Uh, when we are taking the star, we are also taking all of the sum complexes. So we can, we can have some of the simplices that are not uh, intersecting with our given sigma. For example, in this case, the blue, uh, the blue circle will be exactly the link of our edge, red edge sigma. And the definition of a combinatorial manifold is that the link of every vertex 
has to be a combinatorial sphere, uh, which means that it is PL homeomorphic to the standard triangulation of the sphere, for example, to the boundary of uh, the uh, simplex of the corresponding dimension. Uh, and also, if K is a combinatorial manifold, then the link of any simplex sigma will be, in fact, just a combinatorial sphere of the corresponding dimension. If this was a part, uh, if this was a part of a combinatorial manifold, and here it is, we see that the link of this edge is exactly uh, just the uh, circle uh, which uh, corresponds to our dimension three here. Uh, okay. Uh, now let me move to uh, some of the classical approaches to the problem of uh, computing combinatorially the contracting classes. Uh, this was a very well-known problem in the 70s and uh, there were a lot of work. I think that one of the most well-known would be Gabriel of Gilfand Lossick's work. And uh, they provided an explicit formula for the first contracting class of a triangulated manifold when the uh, manifold has a given smoothing. So first of all, this manifold has to be a triangulation of a smooth manifold. Second of all, you have to fix a smoothing of the manifold, which is uh, quite a tricky thing to do in most explicit case, cases. Uh, this given smoothing gives you some additional combinatorial data. Uh, and using this combinatorial data, you can, uh, you can write an explicit formula in terms of some, in quite difficult terms. Uh, this approach was developed further and uh, moreover, you can, you can um, you, the, the step of a given smoothing can be omitted, but you have to, you have to approximate around, uh, uh, around among all smoothings of a triangulation, which is also a very difficult step. Uh, the only known uh, computation using this formula uh, is uh, a work by Millin, and uh, it takes 25, I believe, pages for a nine vertex triangulation of a complex projective plane. Uh, moreover, if you have a triangulated manifold where you do not have a given smoothing, for example, a combinatorial manifold which does not admit a smooth structure, uh, then you cannot apply the obtained formulae. By the way, I have to mention that Rothin Schwartz's uh, theorem uh, also tells us that we uh, can define rational contracting classes not only for smooth manifolds, but for arbitrary PL manifolds. And more or less, they approve also. Uh, you, one of the parts of the proof is such a definition, in fact. Uh, okay. Mm. A second approach, which is uh, more of a connection between different areas than uh, a real uh, explicit formula, is Chigurh's approach. Uh, he um, suggested uh, to endow each of the simplices of the triangulated manifold with a local effect metric, and then consider Laplace operators uh, in the space of all L2 integrable differential forms of the links of the simplices of your manifold. And then in terms of the spectra of those Laplace operators, uh, you can write explicit formulas for the L polynomial. However, those spectra uh, do not have or at least no combinatorial formula for those spectra is known. And um, this does not lead to any explicit computations. However, this is a very interesting connection, so I had to mention it. Uh, from the point of computing and uh, an algorithmic solution to the problem and having an explicit formula that would work for explicit case, uh, I think that uh, um, the first formula that helps the first formula where explicit computations are possible is uh, the formula due to Professor Guy Fulin in 2004. And uh, it is a computable local formula for the first contracting class of any combinatorial manifold. So the manifold does not have to be, to admit any smooth structure, for example. So it's any combinatorial manifold. Uh, and in 2008, uh, Professor Gafulin also uh, presented an algorithm for the higher contracting classes, uh, 
Uh, however, I have to say that uh, although the formula for the first Pontragon class is completely explicit and computable, uh, and uh, although the formula of 2008 is an algorithmic solution of a problem, so th th this is an algorithm, uh, it is uh, the length of the algorithm is not uh, applicable to any explicit computations. Uh, in contrary to the first Pontragon class, where we will demonstrate as well that uh, this leads to precise computations. Uh, one of the main things, the main ingredients of uh, the proof and uh, one of the main definitions of today's talk is by stellar moves. Let us have an arbitrary combinatorial manifold. And suppose that uh, our combinatorial manifold has a full subcomplex, uh, which is the join of a simplex and of a boundary of a simplex. Uh, let me show first some cheap pictures. So for example, uh, and sorry, one, one thing that I have to mention is that the convention is that the boundary of the, uh, of the point is the empty set and that the join of uh, the empty set of the simplex is the simplex itself. So for example, uh, here in dimension two, uh, this uh, on the left side, you have your two dimensional simplex uh, join the boundary of a point, which is the empty set. Uh, so the simplex itself, and you replace this with the boundary of this two dimensional simplex join the point. So here you have your point, here you have your boundary of your two dimensional simplex. Uh, and so uh, here you have your bistellar move. The second case in dimension two would be if sigma would be an edge. And here you see sigma join uh, the boundary of the second edge tau, which is re replaced with the boundary of sigma join tau. Uh, so combinatorial in dimension two, those are the only two cases. And uh, on the um, bottom of the uh, page, you can see uh, the co corresponding cases in dimension three. For example, here, sigma would be this two-dimensional simplex and tau would be uh, this edge. Uh, let me draw it in red, this edge. And you can see that sigma join the boundary of tau is replaced with tau join the boundary of sigma. Uh, in higher dimensions, you have a bit more variety of such, uh, of such uh, moves because uh, the, how do they look like depends on the di dimension of sigma. Uh, however, we will only be interested in dimensions two and three for today's talk. Uh, very important to know that we receive, of course, a PL homeomorphic. Uh, if we apply a bistellar move to a manifold, we receive a, PL, a manifold which is PL homeomorphic to the initial one. And uh, a crucial result for us is that if two manifolds are PL homeomorphic, one to another, then there exists a sequence of bistellar moves uh, that relates uh, those two combinatorial manifolds. So whatever two triangulations I know, for example, of a two-dimensional sphere I take, I will be able to find a sequence of bistellar moves that connects them. Uh, now we will construct a graph from those, uh, using those bistellar moves. Uh, all the vertices of this graph will be all uh, oriented simplicial two spheres up to isomorphism where the isomorphism is simplex preserving. Uh, so it is a, uh, an isomorphism which preserves vertices edges. So it, it completely preserves the triangulation itself. It is, for example, a relabeling. And the edges are isomorphism classes of bistellar moves. Uh, the formula of Professor Gefulin is based on uh, writing down an explicit co-cycle on this, an explicit sorry cohomology class on this uh, on this graph, which is just a just a function on all of the cycles of this graph, and uh, we'll have to explicitly de just define it, which is more or less easy to do it, on uh, some elementary cycles in the graph gamma two, then. And those cycles will be generating the space of all the cycles on the gamma two graph. So, okay, now we're get, getting completely explicit. Uh, for example, we have cycles of this form, where I mean that um, 
mm, here we have some two dimensional sphere, right? And those are two simplices inside of it. We can uh, commute two different bistellar moves uh, by first applying it uh, a move to the first simplex and then applying a move to the second simplex and then doing uh, the same thing in reverse order. Uh, and so we have such a cycle, uh, which is uh, a cycle in our graph gamma two. Um, and uh, we want to uh, see what is the value of this cohomology class. So for such a cycle, the value is zero, is defined to be zero. Uh, if the sets, those two triangles, they intersect, then uh, this is where the interesting uh, thing begins. Then this value has to depend on the number of triangles on both sides of uh, the intersection of those two dimensional simplices. And here the value is a rational function in, uh, in those variables and those variables P and Q. Uh, I want to stress that it does not depend on the combinatorics of the sphere itself. It only depends on those two numbers P and Q. Uh, so whatever sphere we take, if we take such a cycle, we have this, we define the value of C to be this one. Uh, and when the intersection uh, of the two triangles of the two simplices is two vertices, then you have uh, uh, another rational function which expresses this value. Uh, there are also uh, some other cycles which can be interesting from uh, points of view. Whatever cycle you take, you will receive some rational functions. By the way, if you take uh, those cycles and you do the same thing for the second type of cycles, which was with the quadrangles, quadrilaterals, and changing their diagonal, you also receive corresponding values. And moreover, those cycles, so those uh, commutations, they generate all of the cycles. So this is a generating family of cycles for the uh, gamma two graph, which means that the class C is entirely defined by its values. Uh, okay, now let's formulate uh, the mm, result uh, that gives you the explicit formula. The first result is that the first, the first very important remark is that the cohomology class C is well defined. Because in the graph gamma two, those cycles do generate a lot of the cycles, but they can be, uh, the, but they are dependent. There are relations between them. So this well defined means that uh, the values do respect those relations. Uh, and now, uh, what is the procedure that relates the first contragon class to this graph gamma two? Uh, so, um, suppose that we have some cycle H that represents our C. So the difference between a, a co-cycle and cohomology class here is just that the cohomology class is only defined on cycles on the graph. And if, as soon as we take a precise co-cycle, uh, it is defined as uh, we can find its value on a precise by stellar move. So take any co-cycle that represents C. For, uh, and then for an oriented simplicial free sphere L, uh, you take the sequence of bistellar moves that relates this sphere L to the boundary of the four dimensional simplex. Such a sequence exists because of Pachner's theorem, uh, which relates to the L homeomorphic uh, manifolds. And now we sum over all, uh, we, uh, we take all of the vertices of this three-dimensional sphere, we induce by stellar moves in the links of the vertices, because if, if we look at the picture, I'm sorry, I'll have to go a bit, uh, for, if, if you look, for example, at this picture, if you take any vertex and you take its link, then in the link, you see a by stellar move of dimension one less, uh, which means that, uh, uh, which means that uh, you can induce by stellar moves on uh, we can you can induce by stellar moves on the links uh, and uh, now uh, you have to take all of those induced by stellar moves for all of those betas and sum the value of the, of the cycle h on those moves and then you receive some function on a function on all combinatorial free spheres. For the first Pontragon class, this function is exactly the coefficient you have to take 
the receiver cycle, which is Poincaré dual to, uh, which represents a homology class Poincaré dual to the first Pontryagin class. Okay. Uh, okay, I think I have to speed up a bit. Uh, I want to mention an application. Uh, briefly mention an application uh, which gives a motivation, so that shows that this formula really gives us explicit computations. So uh, there is a very well, no, there is a, an interesting theorem about combinatorial manifolds that tells you the following, that uh, suppose we draw on a graph all combinatorial manifolds and dimensional with D vertices. Uh, I'm sorry, there is a typo here with D vertices. So it is obvious then uh, that there are no combinatorial manifolds, so closed combinatorial manifolds. There are no combinatorial manifolds uh, of dimension, let's say six with three vertices. We need at least eight. Uh, and uh, the smallest uh, number of vertices we can have is n plus two for the boundary of a simplex. And then the non-trivial result uh, is that you have a second line uh, this 3n, 3n over 2 plus 3 line, and in between the boundary, the, the boundary of the simplices and this blue line, you only have triangulations of spheres. And the most interesting ab after, about this, and this is that this is an exact, this is in some sense the, the exact line where you cannot you cannot draw further, because on this line you have exactly four points, where you could have. Uh, non-spheres. Uh, in fact, on this line, it could be the only non-spheres it could be are manifolds that admit the Morse function with exactly three critical points. And such functions, such uh, Morse functions exist only on manifolds of dimensions 0, zero 2, 4, 8, and 16. And the most classical examples are the projective planes. More precisely, if you look on this, on, on this line, uh, we have here the only object in dimension two, which is not non-sphere, is, is the triangulation of RP2 with six vertices, which is received by the antipodal uh, factoring out the antipodal involution on the icosahedron. <laughs> in dimension four, the only object which is a non-sphere is the triangulation of CP2 with nine vertices. However, in dimensions eight and 16, um, in dimension 16, nothing is known. Not a single example was constructed. But in dimension eight, an example was constructed, and it would be a very nat natural guess for it to be the quaternionic projective plane. However, it is not the only possibility. There is, a, there is a, uh, an infinite series there that could be, uh, uh, for which M815 could be the triangulation. And so uh, the question was, um, you know, in 19, 1987, Bremen um, Kuhnel, uh, stated a conjecture whether the, this manifold is indeed the quaternionic projective plane or not. In fact, this uh, the existence of such a homeomorphism is uh, exactly the uh, can be exactly received by computing the Pentragon class. And uh, so, using uh, Gaifullin's algorithm. Uh, I showed by explicitly computing the first Pontryagin class that indeed the Pontryagin class of this combinatorial manifold corresponds to the Pontryagin class of the quaternionic projective plane, uh, which proves that they are uh, in fact piecewise linear homeomorphic. Moreover, that this is a vertex minimal triangulation of HP2. I have to mention that this is uh, the only known, and that there was no. Uh, other triangulations of the continuous projective planes known before, uh, because it is difficult to, con to construct a triangulation for a manifold with such uh, with such few, few cells. In fact, okay. Now uh, let me move to more recent results. Uh, I mentioned earlier that you have to uh, that uh, there was this arbitrary choice of a representative of C, the cohomology class in the graph gamma two. And one of the very interesting questions is, can you find an explicit representative, which would be natural in any sense? And uh, so the question is, how do you find such a cycle H and are there any natural representatives? So the rest of the talk will be devoted to, uh, I think, stating the, uh, the result, uh, the construction of such a cycle H. 
Uh, so generally, when you do explicit computations, you do not need to explicitly choose age, but you do need it to get an explicit local formula because whenever you want to explicitly write your function f, you need to choose an age, and then uh, which gives you a uh, which gives you a local formula. Uh, okay, so uh, our result with Professor Guy uh is uh, such an explicit formula, and there are two key ingredients. And the two key ingredients are uh, that it is uh, the formula is in terms of the redistribution of some weights over a triangulation of the two-dimensional sphere uh, under bistellar move. So we will have two-dimensional spheres that will change under bistellar moves, and we will try to encode some data by saying that there is a combinatorial curvature of the sphere that is moving under those bistellar moves. Uh, this seems to be a very uh, natural idea because, um, because of the corresponding smooth picture with uh, the uh, churn whale theory and the expression, for example, of the first point tracking class using curvature. Uh, however, it is quite sketchy to say this. Uh, and uh, this is an understatement, I'd say. Uh, and the second ingredient is to define a generalized link number of one cycles in a simplicial free sphere. So usually you can only take a uh, um, linked number of one cycles that are where the support is non-intersecting. However, we will uh, need to define a linked number for any two one cycles in a free sphere. And this is the second key ingredient. Uh, first of all, let me define the, uh, oh, yeah, I am very sorry I have uh, so this is this is a bit of an older notation. I have forgot to change it here. And uh, so whenever you see Eulerian weights, please consider this to be combinatorial curvature for the moment. Uh, I'm sorry about this. So uh, I mean, those are two more or less, more or less, more or less uh, equivalently equivalently uh, intuitive uh, names for this for this function. But let's call it combinatorial curvature for this talk. Uh, okay, so whenever you have a two-dimensional simplicial sphere and you have its vertex, uh, so let, let's have the degree of this vertex. And then let's define uh, just uh, or a number which is one minus this degree over six. We will call this number the combinatorial curvature of, of this vertex V. Uh, why, is it the, why do we call it this way? Because the sum of all of those weights, uh, all of those curvatures, give us exactly the Euler characteristic of the sphere, which is two. And moreover, if you endow every triangle of your of your triangulation with the metric of a regular triangle, then the corresponding, uh, the corresponding uh, number multiplied by two pi will be exactly the integral, integral, sorry, curvature at point, at vertex V. Uh, and now we would like to define how do those combinatorial curvatures uh, change under by stellar moves. Uh, so uh, first of all, we can see that uh, in the first type of moves, for example, uh, the curvature at this point changes by minus one over six. This vertex appears with curvature one over two, and each one of those also loses one six of their curvature because there is an additional vertex coming from it. And so we say that those three vertices give one six for their curvature to the new vertex. Uh, in the second case, uh, this is just a technicality uh, to say that they give a negative number. Uh, th this just makes the formula look a bit better and uh, you can just consider that this is 1 12th moved the other way. Uh, we do 1 12th just for the sake of symmetry because this uh, gives us less, uh, a better possibility for ignore all choices. Uh, now we'll need to define uh, a special three-dimensional sphere, which is defined uh, from a bistellar move of two spheres. So we have two, sphere two, two spheres, L1 and L2, and uh, we have a bistellar move from one to the other. And uh, so now let's take the cone of a one sphere, the cone of a two sphere, and try to glue them together. They almost everywhere glue together, except for the place where the bistellar move happens. And 
In fact, for to complete the gluing, you only need to add one additional three-dimensional simplex. It is exactly the join of those segment tau that define our bistellar move. So for example, here, this is just the bistellar move that changes uh, this sigma for this tau, right? And so this is the only places where those two spheres did not glue together. So you receive a free that, and now this is more or less the suspension of a sphere. Uh, so uh, nearly the suspension, but this is indeed a three-dimensional combinatorial sphere. And now we'll have to define a set of chains on this uh, three-dimensional sphere. Those chains will be will illustrate this redistribution of weights. We want to make the path. How does the curvature uh, move from one from one uh, point to another? So uh, let me uh, skip this a bit. Just uh, I will show the, you the pictures that there are some paths with some weights attributed to them corresponding to how did the curvature change. So you have some uh, some of the weights which are staying in place and some of the weights which are moving as in this picture. And you receive uh, in this way a family of one chains on your three-dimensional sphere L beta. And now you have this set of chains and you want to glue them together into a cycle. Moreover, this will be a cycle in the tensor product of uh, one uh, of the one chains tensor by one chains. And uh, the definition of this element is uh, it is just explicitly which is just explicitly constructed of, of, from all of those chains of the three-dimensional sphere. Uh, so the proposition is that this element is a cycle in the tensor product of uh, cycles of one cycles of on our L beta. Uh, now, how do we define the generalized Lincoln number? Uh, so let me have a three-dimensional simplicial sphere and let me have two cycles of disjoint support. Then there is no problem with the Lincoln number. However, we want to do, in fact, we will want to take uh, the intersection of, uh, the, sorry, the Lincoln number of Xi beta. Uh, it is a cycle here, so we can consider uh, that uh, it is the sum of some alpha i tensor by beta i and we will want to take the generalized Lincoln number of those guys and sum them all over. But those guys can be, can be and will be self-intersecting. Uh, so, okay, so we have two arbitrary cycles and now we want to take one of them and shift it out of the one skeleton into the dual uh, cell decomposition. Uh, and we would like to do this in a, in a uh, in a canonical way, uh, so that it would only depend on the combinatorics of the sphere, so that we would not have any choice. And we have this operator shift that just sends each vertex into uh, a, into the rational sum of uh, all the vertices in the dual cells, uh, and similarly for all uh, the edge into uh, all edges into all edges in the dual cell with just the same weights. So suppose you can think about this as that each vertex is sent with equal probability to any of the dual cells, for example. Uh, so you receive a rational cycle from this one. Even with if you began with an integer cycle, you receive a rational cycle. But this is no problem for the Lincoln number. The Lincoln number can be taken for rational cycles with uh, uh, that are not intersected. Uh, okay, so uh, now we shift one of those cycles and we take just the classical linking number uh, and you receive this generalized linking number uh, that eats to arbitrary cycles and gives you a rational number. Uh, so now uh, what do we want to do in fact? We want, we define how to, how to shift everything, but now we have to glue those shifting to get shiftings together and also do it in an invariant way in some way that will be only depending on the combinatorics of the uh, sphere that, that we're using. I will not stop on this one, but this can be done in a more or less similar fashion. And you just can glue them in some way that will be, uh, that will be uh, canonical in the sense that it does not depend on the combinatorics. Uh, and so now you can construct, you can shift entirely all of this one, one cycle, and you have this generalized Lincoln number, that, and you can feed your cycle Xi beta to it. Uh, 
uh, and we define the value of the function h or the cocycle h to be the generalized linking number of this xi beta. So xi beta is constructing from the bistellar move of two dimensional spheres. So h is a function on the edges in the graph gamma two. So h is the function on all bistellar moves on of two dimensional spheres. <laughs> and uh, the theorem is that this cocycle indeed represents the cohomology class C, which was described above. Uh, so the final formula uh, in this case would be that you take any arbitrary three-dimensional sphere L, you uh, once more just take the value of H on all similar, it's absolutely the same as in Gaffoulin's formula, but now this guy is, uh, we just explicitly take it to be this generalized linking number of this cycle. Uh, okay, uh, I want, I don't think, I, I don't have any time to give a sketch of the proof. So I'll leave, a, 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 I think I'll leave just a, a minute, but let me just say a very general word. The general, very general word is that the proof is more or less combinatorial. It, it requires a lot of, uh, in fact, you, you want to show that your cocycle H uh, has the same values on all cycles as your cohomology class C. So for every cycle, you want to check what's the value of our H, of our generalized Lincoln number on this cycle. Does it correspond to the class C that we described earlier? And for this, you have to do a lot of, you have to construct a four sphere from your cycle of bistellar moves. So we construct the free sphere from a bistellar move itself and the four cycle and the four sphere, sorry, from a cycle of bistellar moves. Uh, so, um, and then you want to make, do some explicit computations on this four sphere uh, with Lincoln numbers. I think I'll stop here. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, and yeah. Well, Denis, thank you very much. Uh, uh, let's thank the speaker. And, uh, are there any questions? <clears throat> uh, okay, if not, <laughs> I think uh, uh, it's too, too long morning session and uh, it's time to finish it. And once more, uh, many thanks for all speakers of this session. And uh, we resume with evening session at uh, 4 uh, p.m. Uh, in Moscow time. Okay, then, ah, well, four, five. <laughs> so, so, okay, uh, now once more, thank you very much and goodbye.